China recently published the uh, Global AI Governance Plan, which talks about creating a giant global model, everybody sharing data and then sharing benefits and having, whereas you know, the, the America AI Action Plan is all focused on America winning, America first. Hi, I'm uh, Alvin Graylin. I've been researching and building products in AI and cybersecurity uh, and semiconductors for uh, three plus decades. I was educated in the U.S. Uh, at University of Washington in Double uh, E, and then uh, at MIT in computer science, uh, specializing in AI as well as uh, in the MBA in business. Xi Jinping and, and Trump recently just met, and, and I think they had a relatively positive meeting. Uh, particularly, I think Trump came out the day after and, and you know praised the the uh, interactions and said it was a 12 out of 10 in terms of what his expectations were. I think it, it's. It's good to see that there's now more communication, and it's also good that they are saying hey, they'll have essentially a, a half a year to a one year truce in terms of the trade war. When looking at what's happening today on the AI side, there's really been no change in position. Uh, in fact, I just saw an interview yesterday uh, from David Sachs, who is the AI czar for uh, the White House, and he's, he specifically said that this will continue to go. We, we need to win. You know, America needs to win the AI race. And so I, I think that um, you know, the, the positive results in terms of at least starting to have dialogue won't necessarily show through in terms of how uh, the, the policies around AI and, and around chip supply will, um, will play out. And in fact, if anything, uh, because of the last several years of, of export controls, indigenous uh, ecosystem for China has become much stronger. And in fact, right now, you know, China's policy is, is uh, asking all of the state-owned companies um, and, and also all of the major labs not to buy uh, NVIDIA chips and use more traditional chips that are coming out of Chinese vendors. And if that's the case, they're essentially you know, playing the strategy of burning the boat, right? By, by not allowing AI chips from uh, America to come in, uh, it forces the, the local labs to then use the local resources, which means that they will give more feedback and, 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 and feedback loop to the local uh, chip vendors and the local hardware vendors so that uh, not only is the hardware going to get better faster, but also there's going to be more use cases for it. Um, there, it will also help them tune their software stack. Uh, because one of the, the biggest uh, advantages that NVIDIA has is not just the hardware, but it's also the, the CUDA stack of uh, all the, the, the routines that have been built uh, into that system over the last several decades. And you know, China is uh, much behind in that area, but by having all these labs and all of the customers starting to use and being uh, forced to use the Chinese chips, uh, it allows the, 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 the local stack to, to catch up much faster. In terms of you know where where is the the, the advances happening? It's clearly you know the U.S. and China are the two major powers, and other countries and regions want to be involved. And you know there is the the concept of sovereign AI that is becoming very popular. Every country wants their own version of AI, and they think that that's how they're going to get the advantage, uh, or you know become at least a, a player, be a player at the table. What a lot of people don't realize is that when you start to hoard data and say, hey, I only I want my data for my model so that it can represent me, but then I don't want anybody else to have my data. What that does is actually creates a less, it creates a less powerful version of the AI because it doesn't have the complete information. What we find today is that an AI that has the most information, the most represent, representative data and perspectives uh, around the world and around different types of information, that AI will be the most intelligent version and will give you the solution that allows all of the different types of, uh, all the different countries and players to, to have a, a utility function that maximizes everybody's utility. Whereas when you create an AI that only takes into the perspective of one country or one people or one religion, then it's saying, I'm the good people, I'm the, I'm the in-group, and the out people is the ones that, that you know, we don't mind having them lose as long as we win. And we need to switch the mindset to say, how can we create an AI where everybody's data is put in so that the, the AI is smart enough to, to be able to account to find a solution that even we as humans may not be able to find, but it's able to find. That's the, the magic of AI. 
is that it, it can take very complex topics, very massive amounts of data, and find the, the one pearl inside that, that could be the solution to a complex problem. And you know, these problems have been plaguing us for you know, decades, if not centuries. Not had a very good, good um, track record of solving these uh, ourselves, but maybe with the help of AI, particularly if these AI are now becoming uh, assistance to the governments to become uh, advisors for diplomacy or becoming policy advisors, it will be able to open our eyes to perspectives that any one individual wouldn't have. Because at the end of the day, uh, these AIs have read every single book, every single piece of history and philosophy and science that has ever been made. And no human has as wide a range of understanding as they do. And we need to use that knowledge and that breadth of information to be able to come up with unique and creative solutions that uh, you know, has eluded us so far. So for, for this to really work, um, it really does take every single country in the world has to participate, and particularly US and China has to participate because um, if, if the two strongest players are not working together, are not uh, helping unite the world, uh, then we will automatically have factions. And if you have factions, uh, then you essentially create an innate rivalry, right? This is unfortunately what's happening today is that we have a bifurcated uh, stack between the, the US stack and now what could be a Chinese stack, right? And in the past, the NVIDIA chips are probably you know, 90 percent plus of the market in China. Now they will be increasingly a smaller amount, which in the long run actually hurts America. You know, so all of these sanctions that was intended to help America is actually backfiring. Um, and all the things that people, countries are doing to create sovereign AI that's supposed to protect itself will actually just create more enemies around the world. What we really need to think about and what the, the major countries, the, the, the China, China's of the world and the, the US of the world, needs to think about how, how can we reframe this race into something where we separate national security from civilian use. Right. It's natural for every country to say, hey, this is national security stuff. I need that separated. I don't want to share my military secrets or defense secrets with another country. That's perfectly fine. But why not start with something like um, sharing medical data so that we can help cure cancer or you know, sharing more um, physics data so that we can find new, new, new materials and particles so that we can get you know, better uh, battery technology or you know, uh, better sciences for, for uh, food generation or you know, all kinds of, of breakthroughs that could help uh, anyone in the world. And we need to have the same type of mindset that we had when uh, things like insulin was, was created or penicillin. When these technologies were created and they had you know, essentially global value to the world, the people who invented them did not patent them, did not keep them from the world. They made it open source so that the, the world can have very low cost uh, you know, antibacterial type of, of technology as well as um, diabetes type medicine. Right? So we, if we look at AI and the benefits it creates as a public good, then these will be natural things for us to do. But if we continue to have this uh, rivalry uh, mindset, then uh, we will limit the value of what this technology can, can bring for us. And uh, it's really up to the, the, the leadership of both countries to do it. The, the, the thing is, I actually looking at what's, what's been published uh, from the two countries, uh, the, the China recently published the uh, Global AI Governance Plan which talks about creating a giant global model, everybody sharing data and then sharing benefits and having countries around the world manage this larger AI model. Whereas you know, the, the America AI action plan is all focused on America winning America first and, and you know, essentially deploying the American models to uh, its allies. When we have these two kind of conflicting strategies about how to treat AI, um, I think it's very difficult right now to, to come to alignment. So in some ways, uh, it's probably the initiative needs to come from the U.S. To, to rethink that actually by working together, cooperation is not a sign of weakness. Cooperation is actually a sign of enlightened self-interest. It's a sign of a more mature and, and wise management model because by, by working together, you both help yourself and you help other people. So the, the, the real crux is actually not necessarily a nation-to-nation -nation conflict. I, I think a lot of the, the problem that we, we have these policies is that there are individuals who are very influential in, 
in the administration today, particularly on the U.S. side, who believe that what their current policy is doing is actually good for America. What they don't necessarily realize is that uh, because of maybe their the, the lack of technical knowledge, because a lot of them are actually lawyers or investors uh, type of, of folks are, are the background of most of the people in, in you know, U.S. government and in some of the policy circles. Um, they don't actually understand what is the, the negative potentials of this and the, and the risk and the safety issues around it and the escalations uh, and also the underlying value of, of uh, GPUs long term. They, they still are clinging on to what used to make AI uh, superior when the, the, the world has moved on from them. And they think that what they're doing is good for the country. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, the people who work for them that maybe know more of the technology, they're afraid to tell the people on top um, that maybe these aren't necessarily the best strategy. Even if they think it's right, they're afraid to say it because they would lose their jobs or maybe they would uh, be, you know, uh, they would reduce their chances of, of progressing in the government circles, right, in their, in their career path. So right now, unfortunately, whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, uh, bashing China and turning China into the enemy is a common platform that everybody agrees to. And it has been the case, you know, no matter which president is in, in, in office for the last, you know, 20, 15 years or so, right? So until the top is willing to say, hey, it's okay to have a, a multipolar world, which the good news is just last week, um, Trump said on, on his tweet, he says, you know, I just had a, a really good G2 meeting. And when he says there's a G2 meeting, that almost automatically is implying that the world now has two major superpowers and those two powers are going to now uh, be able to both uh, play a significant role. Whereas in the past, the, the, the position from America was really focused on American dominance and American hegemony. So it actually gives me hope that what is being said by Trump can then be passed on to his staff and will give them the permission uh, to say what is right from a technical perspective and from a societal perspective to ensure both the, the goodness that will come from this technology gets deployed uh, the right way in America and also the right way uh, to, to the rest of the world. In fact, one of the, the, in the same tweet that, that Trump talked about G2, he also said he believes that China and the U.S. will work together to create a long-term successful peaceful world. That, to me, um, is essentially the, the kind of uh, message I would love to hear from, from our leaders. And for him to have said that, um, I think it is, a, it is a good sign that you know, there may be a change in, in the, the climate in terms of the ability to start having these kind of conversations, which was impossible just six months ago. Mm -hmm.